Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, chapter four of First Peter, here's what it says. Therefore, since Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So he's saying, arm yourself with the same mind that Jesus had who suffered in the flesh. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. If if you've just made a decision, I'm going to live right. I'm going to do what God's called me to do. And whatever suffering that causes, that's it. He said, that's the way Jesus was. Jesus did what the Father wanted him to do, and it caused him suffering. But he went ahead through with it anyway. And Peter said, if we'll live that same way, then those of us who have determined to suffer whatever we have to suffer to live right, we've ceased from sin. Verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, or we could say the will of unbelievers. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatry, idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation or wasted living, uh, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So he's saying that people who are on the outside, They'll ask you, hey, come on, let's do this. Let's go drinking. Let's let's go do this. And uh, hey, what about that girl? She looks like you like she likes you. And you're thinking, no, I'm married. <laughs> or you may even say that. And say, they'll say, so what? See, we live in a perverse world. We live in a perverse society that a perversion is something that was twisted or uh, distracted away, distorted away. We live in a society that has been twisted. It's been perverted. And so people, just the way they think, the logic, the reason uh, upon which they, they, uh, they make their decisions, their worldview is completely skewed and tainted. It's not accurate. It's not pure. It's not correct. But we who know God, God through his precious word, the Bible, has come and explained to us how this all works and what's right and what's wrong. And when we receive that, oh, it makes all the difference in the world, but the world's still not gonna understand it. So they're they're gonna say, well, why don't you do this? And why can't you do it? Is it just a bunch of rules? Is it religion? And they're gonna think that it's some religious concoction or that you know priests or uh, televangelists or pastors or whoever are manipulating you, trying to get you to do what they want you to do, give them money or whatever. And they're just not going to get it because they don't know the truth of God's word. They don't know God. They don't have that insight. They're living in ignorance. They're worldly people. And so this says that, that they're not going to understand us. Nonetheless, when Jesus comes back, oh, everything's going to put to light. They'll understand, but it'll be too late for them if they haven't turned by that point. They'll understand. Everybody will understand. The Bible said every knee should bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So everybody will eventually admit that the gospel that we believe is true. But right now, most of the world, they do not believe it. So once again, verse 6, For this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, talking about 
to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, dead spiritually, that to those who are dead, they have not been made alive in the Lord yet, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So if somebody gets born again in the flesh, they haven't been changed yet, but their spirit, oh, they can begin to live an eternal life unto God. Verse seven, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious. And this is why these statements like this, but the end of all things is at hand. I believe the Holy Spirit wanted that in there. But in Peter's heart and mind, the Bible says, in fact, Peter says in Second Peter, that knowing this first, no prophecy of Scripture is of a private interpretation or a private origin. For holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So Peter's writing this, and it's accurate, but that doesn't mean that he fully understands it. But the Holy Spirit who inspired him to write it understands. So when Peter says, but the end of all things is at hand, the Holy Spirit knows in God's perspective, where a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, uh, it is at hand. But Peter might be thinking, this is going to come in my life. Well, Jesus didn't come back a second time in Peter's lifetime. So, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. Notice how often Peter brings up love, loving one another, kindness and such. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Where do you think he learned that? <laughs> You're right. He learned it from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus was as loving as they come. I mean, the love of God personified. And so it says, love one another, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. What does that mean? When you love somebody, you're not looking to embarrass them, to expose them, to humiliate them. You're looking to see how to cover their sins. That doesn't mean a cover up. That doesn't mean sweeping sins under the carpet. It means that you don't want to let the damage that's caused by the sin be cause any more damage. You don't want that sin to cause any more damage. You want to mitigate that. You want to see those sins forgiven and for that sin to be stopped and the adverse effects of it. That's love. That's the way we are with our children. We don't want their mistakes to harm them any more than they absolutely have to. So love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. If you're going to invite somebody, say, hey, listen, I know you don't have a place. Hey, you can stay at my house for a couple of weeks. That's great. But he said, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Peter's saying, look, don't invite somebody to come over. Then in another conversation with somebody, say, yeah, it's just, they don't have any place to go, but it's just ridiculous, you know. They should have done it. No, if you're going to be hospitable and you're going to be kind to the person to their face, then speak that way all the time. Let your heart be pure. Let your heart be undivided and be hospitable from the heart and let it, let it happen that way. Verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Everybody has received a gift from God in terms of what you're called to do in ministry. Everyone. He said, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. Don't just say, well, I'm not using my gift. No, use it. Don't let it be the buried talent of the parable of the talents. No. Use what God has given you to do your part as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If you're going to speak, then speak the way that God would want you to speak. Speak what God wants to say. And that's speaking as the oracles of God. See, and so if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He said, listen, if you're going to minister, then don't just minister with natural, logical gifts and abilities and strategies and techniques. No, but minister in a way through prayer and the power of the Spirit so that God's in on it and God is causing supernatural results because that's what's going to impact people, not only the impact of the results, but the impact 
of watching God use somebody and God uh, uh, corroborate, God proving with signs and wonders, so to speak, that this person is actually with him in the Lord. Verse 12, Beloved, do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Don't think it's strange that you're going through these difficult trials and maybe even persecutions. He's saying, don't think something strange happened to you, but rejoice, verse 13, to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceedingly, with exceeding joy. So he's saying, don't be surprised at the trials, he said, but rejoice to the extent that you're partaking of the sufferings of Jesus. Jesus went through these kinds of trials. And so you going through these kinds of trials for doing right before the Lord, he said, you need to rejoice about that and be glad with exceeding joy. Why? You're on the right track. You're sharing in the sufferings of Jesus. You're doing it. You're putting yourself out there to be godly and to share the gospel and so on. And you're being persecuted for it. He said, you ought to be excited about that. You're on the right track because an immature person would not let that happen. Verse 14, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Just think about that. If you're reproached, Peter was among those in Acts, I believe the fourth chapter, where they were beaten, they were, the 12 were beaten for preaching the gospel. And when they walked away, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. <laughs> so Peter knows what he's talking about. He's endured a lot of persecution. And he says, uh, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. In other words, God is very well aware of what's happening and his, the, his spirit and his glory rest on you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. So notice what they're doing to you, they're blaspheming God. But what you're doing to do righteous and to endure this suffering, you're actually glorifying God. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. In other words, well, don't do wrong things that provoke backlash. Don't suffer like that because that's not the kind of suffering for righteousness sake. Verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. See, if you're suffering for wrongdoing, well, that's there's no credit for that. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. In other words, you don't need to hide that. Uh, that you must be doing something wrong. No, don't be ashamed of that. Don't be ashamed of suffering or going through suffering as a believer. Verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Notice judgment begins at the house of God. God doesn't just go judge the wicked before he even cleanses his own house. God wants to come to us as believers and get us straightened out and judge us and see us forgiven and right. And then he'll go to the world. So judgment begins with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So in other words, if God's going to judge his people who are born again, who are saved, how much worse is it going to be when he goes to judge those who are not? Verse 18. Now, if the righteous, uh, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? So if we're barely saved because of uh, needing to uh, live right before God and not succumb to the pull of sin to get us back off of the faith in Jesus, he said, oh, how bad it's going to be for those who never have received the Lord. Verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful 
creator. So we need to submit our souls to the Lord. We need to come and say, Lord, my soul, my flesh is tempted to sin, but I'm committing it to you, asking you to strengthen me by the Holy Spirit. Help me not to sin. Help me to stay far from sin. Jesus said, pray this, lead us not into temptation. Lord, lead me far away from the temptation. Keep me so separated. Help me to pluck the eye out, cut the hand off, so to speak, and Throw them far from me so that I'm not anywhere near that temptation. This is the way that we ought to be praying. This is the way that we ought to be calling on the Lord. Why? Because sin is always at the door looking to take us down. And I'm not just talking about making a mistake. I'm saying sin is looking to completely consume us and drag us back out of obedience to the Lordship of Christ. And oh, let me tell you, a lot of people have been dragged out and they don't even realize that they're not really serving the Lord anymore. And Peter is flagging this. And uh, I pray in Jesus' name that this does not happen to us. Lord, keep us in your will. Keep us in your grace. Strengthen us by the Holy Spirit, not to give place to all those little temptations that want to drag us away and cause big sins in our lives. Help us, Lord, to stay pure and to walk in complete obedience in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you again for watching today. If you haven't already done it, click the like button and share this video with others to help them get into God's word. Also, we'd love to partner with you to advance the kingdom of God. To find out more about our BFAM strategy, our ministry school, the BFAM Training Center, other great teaching resources, or to launch a house church, visit solidlives.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you tomorrow.